It's one o'clock on a Monday afternoon, so you must be watching Think Tech Hawaii, research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and today we have two guests. We have Caleb Brignac, who is an undergraduate student in the Global Environmental Studies program at UH Manoa, and Jim Patera, who is a specialist in the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, also at UH Manoa. So welcome to the both of you. We're going to have a fascinating discussion today. Um, the focus is on marine plastics. Mm -hmm. And I think um, this is a particularly important topic for everybody who's living here in Hawaii who goes to the beach, which is everyone, of course. <laughs> and so um, let's start off the discussion. Jim, tell us a little bit about, say, the, the global significance of this study. Sure, sure. So um, in, in SOAS, we do a lot of work with that's ocean related and one of the topics that came up back in 2011 was what's going to happen to all the debris that came into the ocean because of the big and tsunami. And SOST is the School of Ocean Earth Science and Sorry, Technology. Sorry, that's correct, yeah. right? Our home. And, um, and, and through that study, uh, a bunch of uh, various groups around the world became very keenly aware of this problem of debris in the ocean. And there have been small studies here and there, but uh, the United Nations got together and decided they wanted to get an, a global inventory of how much plastic really was out there. And actually, there was a, an article in the New York Times just a few days ago that cited a, a paper that came out in Science that says that uh, over 8 billion tons of plastic have been produced since the Billion 1950s. with a B. Billion with a B, that's yeah. right. And uh, That's a ton uh, per person on the planet. That's right. Yeah. And of that, uh, half of it has, has come since 2004. So we're on this sort of exponential trajectory. And if you look at the, uh, the cleanup efforts and the recycling efforts, the amount that's being recycled and being cleaned up off of beaches and other places is, is just a mere fraction of what's being produced. So there's this, this big question about, about where is all the plastic going. So uh, our contribution was to, to look at ocean circulation. And we had this, this idea that if we could forecast uh, where things were drifting about in the ocean, we could find these, these areas of, of concentrated plastics. And one of, the, one of the regions that's been getting a lot of press in the past several years is these, these um, they call these uh, global uh, garbage patches. So there's a few of these in the world oceans. And uh, there's sort of this misconception that you could go there and you'd be looking at a debris field. And actually, if you went there, uh, we've done cruises out there, it, it looks like blue ocean, but if you tow an instrument through the water and collect things, you'll see a lot of plastic. So, so this is a, a global problem. It's not just in the Pacific Ocean. It's Correct. the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean as That's well. Right. And it's of such importance that the United Nations have commissioned you and some colleagues to That's do right. a, a research study on this. That's right. And, and you know, there's a lot of difficult aspects to the problem, one of, one of which is that, that plastics are tremendously valuable to, to humankind. So we can't just say, let's eliminate plastics. Mm -hmm. and it, it's a question of how big a problem is this and what can we do about it? So we're really at the first steps of this and, and that's okay. why. And, and, and just to, <laughs> to finish, out, you, you're what's called a physical oceanographer. So you study where the water goes. That's right, that's right. Chemistry and temperature, okay. So, and then Kayla, yes. as an undergraduate student, <laughs> Yes. What's your role in this? The United Nations presumably <coughs> didn't ask you to do this. I know. <laughs> Not yet. Anyway. Not yet. Maybe in the future. Um, no, so I'm doing a research study on the composition of polymer type of marine plastics throughout the Hawaiian archipelago. So I have um, been working with a lot of collaborators on other islands, NOAA, um, the Pacific Whale Foundation, Hawaii Wildlife Fund, a few others, and they've collected samples for me, so I've been analyzing them um, to be able to ID what kind of polymer they are. Um, okay. which Polymers, it sounds as if you might be a chemist, is that true? <laughs> um, yes, okay. a, young, a young chemist, um, that's my background. Um, so you know, most, most consumer goods when we see them, they have that resin code labeled on the bottom, one through seven, and that is an indicator of what the plastic is made out of. Um, and so that's essentially what I've been trying to determine because when you see marine debris, they don't necessarily have these resin codes on them. A lot of them are just, you know, little tiny fragments or um, they've just been weathered down 
are kind of mechanically broken down so much that we don't know what they are. And so I've been trying to determine that. And your focus is predominantly on the Hawaiian Islands, is yes. that correct? Yes, yeah. All right. And you mentioned the term called marine debris, and I think we brought along a slide. If we could see the first slide, which would actually show you go out <laughs> and walk across Hawaii beaches, right? So yeah. is this what yeah. you would refer to as marine debris? Yes. Yeah. So this was actually in Kahuku, one of my sampling sites um, on the north shore of Oahu. Okay. Um, this beach in particular is extremely ridden with marine debris. And I believe they had actually just recently done a beach cleanup here a few days prior. So this isn't even as bad as this beach can get. Um, and it's amazing because you can't, see the magnitude of it in the picture. You see a lot of big pieces in the picture, and then when you sit down in the sand and you start going through it, you find so many little tiny pieces, so many little pieces of line, fragments, foam. I mean, it's really amazing when you kind of start digging through And this obviously it. is of significance not only to people who like to sit on pristine <laughs> beaches, but for the marine ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, I would imagine that you know, fish might be entangled in the bigger pieces mm -hmm. of debris as well as the, the smaller pieces which they might eat yeah. thinking it's food, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, well, even when I'm going through my samples, it's hard to determine. Is this some kind of biology? Is this a rock? I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then I cut it open, I'm like, oh no, that's plastic. Really? So if it's hard for us to determine it, I mean, I can't even imagine what it would like for some kind of organism to not, you know, to not know that it's not food. Not eat it okay. and get it in there. But, but lots of us go down to like Caimana Beach or Ala Moana Beach. We don't see it there. Jim, it, it, you know, is this something that's prevalent on all Hawaiian islands that, you know, unless people are picking it up almost daily, will we see it on Waikiki Beach or is there some ocean circulation which. Yeah, usually um, the working hypothesis now is that. that the, the trade winds are blowing these these things ashore, uh -huh. and here in Hawaii we have what are called high islands. So if you look out the window, you see mountains, and if you can imagine if the trade winds are blowing, let's say on the windward side, it's not going to pick up a bottle and blow it to the leeward side of the island. Whereas other places in the Pacific, that may well happen. You have an atoll, and trash would just blow right across it. So for the high islands, uh, most of the time we see accumulations on the windward side. But the interesting thing, and, and one of the things that, that, that Kayla's been looking at is, you, ima you might imagine that the whole windward side would be the same density of debris, and it's actually individual hot spots. And we're trying to figure out what, what is it about these hot spots? Is it that there are no people there, or there are a lot of people cleaning up? So as an example, Waikiki is, is relatively clean, um, most likely because the hotels do a good job of sweeping <laughs> it every day. <laughs> so there's a high number of people there, so you imagine a high number of, of debris, but in fact, it's, it's the opposite because of the, the, the cleanup efforts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And to get some better feel of the magnitude in the second slide, I think, Kaylee, you, you, you brought along an image of two of your colleagues. If you see the second slide. Yes. So that's Melissa. This just looks horrendous. <laughs> um, this was actually all collected from Midway. So I from was, Midway Island. Mm -hmm. okay. I was able to sample or subsample these from um, NOAA. They provided them. Um, I don't remember exactly when they were out there, but this was over a duration of a couple months that they were out there collecting all of this plastic. And you can see a lot of it's buoys, um, nets, line. So it's a good indication that it's from ocean-based sources. All right. Uh, and, and as a chemist, can you actually say where some of this material comes from? If it's produced in, say, Asia or if it's produced in North America from the, the chemistry of the material? We or? can't necessarily track where it was manufactured. Uh -huh. um, there are some samples that I have, if they're intact, that'll have Asian writing on them. Um, so that is a good indicator. But just from the chemistry itself, not not necessarily, not, not necessarily. yet. Um, there is something, a uh, theory going around that you might be able to age the plastics based off of the form and it, oh, this is going to get really heavy into the chemistry, so I'm um, not going to talk about <laughs> but, but by aging, <laughs> do you mean when the plastic was manufactured or how long has it been how in the water? How long it was in the environment is what we're thinking. Okay, so that you can get some idea of perhaps how rapidly it's building up on the beach or yeah. 
how long it was in the open ocean. That sort yeah, of that's what we're hoping, which is something that I plan on diving into in the future. So I haven't had a chance to go quite into that yet. But I, this is something that actually I think surprises a lot of people because you know you're used to watching TV shows and people can radiocarbon date things down to the day, but yeah. plastic is so persistent that it's 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 extremely difficult to age a piece of plastic and you pull a bottle off a beach and you have no idea if it was dropped there last week or 20 years ago mm -hmm. unless it has a label on it uh -huh. and so that's why the work that, sh that she's doing right now is, is so critically important because it it, it it fills one of the gaps in uh, sort of this idea of, of if you're tracking something in the ocean if you don't know how old it is and you don't know where it came from all you know is where it is now you have no idea. Like I said, it could have been dropped off a boat that morning, or it could come from Japan three years ago, yeah. and with no identifiable markings on it. And, and oh, although I line. presume, Jim, that there will be certain instances, say like after the Fukushima tsunami, where you had, you know, on a specific day, there were all this debris being put into the ocean. And, 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 you know, is that where you can provide Kale with some you know, quantitative information this piece of junk's been in the ocean for six years or, or what? Yes, right now, if some of the bigger pieces that we found from Japan uh, are mainly the floating debris that mm -hmm. get driven by a combination of not only ocean currents, but the winds actually. So the winds are blowing these in a more direct path than the ocean currents would. And if we can identify these as coming, having come from Japan, from that prefecture, then we can say, okay, this is most likely from that event, mm -hmm. and we can say, well, now here's a six-year-old piece of plastic or, or whatever. Are there other design. examples where you can pin down the exact date? I mean, like with a tanker sinking? Right, so there have been several cases of, of accidents at sea that are well documented. So um, one was a container full of Nike tennis shoes, mm -hmm. or trainers, as you might say. <laughs> and um, we, so we knew exactly when that went in the water and where, and, and people collect them and those those are easily identifiable you know it's not like a plastic bottle a, a, what started as a brand new Nike shoe is okay. <laughs> is easy to see and you say oh well, I found this and you know, we rely on citizen scientists essentially to find these things and and let us know that where and when and then mm -hmm. we can date it through that uh, and as we said at the beginning of the show this is a global problem presumably yes. it's not just in tropical islands it's uh, around the, the US and Asian coastline and so forth yeah. right yeah. right yeah. I think a lot of the main uh, plastic uh, producers are in the Western Pacific so Southeast Asia and China areas um, confounding that they're also um, somewhat behind in their waste treatment so a lot of these things are um, open um, uh, garbage dumps essentially so the, the rubbish is not treated here we burn a lot of plastics but mm -hmm. in in some of the developing countries it's just a big pile and so the wind comes and your pile is now in the ocean and drifting around mm -hmm. right. well we're getting near the midpoint of the show um, so before the break let me just say uh, hopefully we'll be having a, a chance to look at some more specific examples of this debris but also why is it important to people not only in Hawaii but also uh, around the world. So let me just uh, remind the viewers, you are watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. My name is Pete McGuinness-Mark, I'm your host, and with me today are uh, Kayla Bugback, who is an undergraduate student uh, at UH Manoa, and Dr. Jim Patemra, who is a specialist also at UH Manoa. And we'll be back in a few minutes. Bye. She said. What are you doing? Research says reading from birth accelerates our baby's brain development. Push! Ah! Read aloud 15 minutes. Every child, every parent, every day. Aloha, I'm Richard Concepcion, the host of Hispanic Hawaii. 
You can watch my show every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. We will bring you entertainment, educational, and also we tell you what is happening right here within our community. Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. And welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness Mark, and today we're talking about ocean plastics with Caleb Buback and Jim Patemra, both from UH Manoa. And Caleb, during the in the mission, you reminded me that you're also uh, working with NIST National Institute of Standards. Is National that? Institute of Standards and Technology. And technology. Yes. Um, let's start off this segment. Briefly, okay. what is NIST? NIST is um, a non-regulatory federal agency within the Department of Commerce and they are responsible essentially for generating new standards and new methods that other scientists can then go out and use for their research. Okay. Um, so I was really lucky actually and I am a recipient of their summer undergraduate research fellowship which is how I've been able to kind of get involved in all of this marine debris um, work. And so they've been funding my project for the summer, and I was paired up with a wonderful mentor who I love dearly. Jennifer Lynch is amazing by far. I mean, she's great. I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't be here uh -huh. today if it wasn't for her. So. Uh, uh, but NIST, why would they be interested in marine debris? Mar marine debris. Um, so there's been a lot of work coming out in regards to marine debris that is using this particular analytical instrument, um, which is what I'm using. And we found some problems with it, or I guess maybe not problems, but kind of discrepancies. Um, and so it's a way for us to essentially analyze this method that's been really common in this field and just say, hey, is this right? Are these people actually doing this the right way? And can we make it better? Um, so that's something that we're, we're exploring yeah. a little bit more. And, and, and you brought along some examples. I did. So, so <laughs> first of all, tell the, the viewers what it is we're looking at here, and um, then we'll see what NIST can actually do to help us. So, this is marine debris that I've collected off the island of Oahu. Um, this plastic bottle is made of peat, which is a number one resin code, and I actually found this on Waikiki. Mm -hmm. I think we're out, outside of Fort Daruzi. Um, so, you can see, I mean, this is fairly intact, doesn't really look like it was weathered too much, so it was probably kind of just dropped on the beach. That's my, that's my guess. Um, these three samples that I have lying on the table, this buoy I found in um, Kuhuku, and this is actually made of PVC, polyvinyl chloride, which is a number three resin code. And this is one of those bad ones that people talk about, and they're just like, hey, you should mm. kind of avoid it, um, mm. because it has a lot of additives, um, it's just not environmentally friendly. So there's good plastics and bad plastics, or bad plastics and very bad plastics? There, yeah, essentially. Yeah, I wouldn't okay. say that there's any good plastics. There's some that are not as um, harmful necessarily as others. Um, and when I, I say that, there's some plastics, especially number threes um, and number sevens, that have a lot of additives in them, and they can be carcinogens, they could be endocrine disruptors, um, and that's something that we need to look more into on the toxicology so side. So it's not just that uh, a marine animal might ingest the plastic uh, and the stomach fills up with junk, mm -hmm. it's also carcinogenic or it can make them sick as well? Potentially. Okay. I mean, that's yeah. something that we definitely need to look, okay. look more and, into. And then we've got other little goodies here. As yeah, well. this uh, is an oyster spacer, which is made at a low density polyethylene, which is not recycled here in Hawaii, by the way. Um, so I don't actually know how these work, but I assume that they, I don't know. I don't know much about the oyster farming, but mm -hmm. they put them in the crates there. And then this is a fragment. Um, so you can see when you're looking at this, you can see how weathered it is, and you can see the square fracturing and just this white layer on top, um, and it's really brittle and fragile. If I try to break this, it'll just crumble to pieces. Um, and this is also made out of polyethylene. And then this, which I just thought was cool and interesting, is a little bread clip, which we see in our everyday lives. And these are actually made of polystyrene, which is another one of these not-so-good plastics. Um, Maui has actually just 
passed a ban on polystyrene or styrofoam. I'm actually not too sure. But yeah, so good to know. And, and Jim, would all of these be floating around the ocean at the same rate, or would some of them sink? Or um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's um, they they would float at at the surface, and something like this, for example, you'd imagine like a, a soccer ball or something would get blown by the wind. So this might travel a lot faster than something like this that would be submerged and you wouldn't mm -hmm. wouldn't see. Mm -hmm. So that. Um, adds a lot of complexity to <laughs> to trying to track this stuff. There are, I mean, plastic polymers do have different densities too, so some are going to be more likely to flow and others are going to be more likely to sink. But, but even if, uh, say, in the top few hundred meters of the water column, they can be transported around, around. The, the ocean by these gyres or the circulation that's right, yeah, pattern. That's right. And, and the, other, uh, the other component to it is, is the radiation from the sun breaks these things down. Mm -hmm. So Kale's absolutely right. You wouldn't see something like this in the ocean. It would be, at least it would be discolored. Mm -hmm. It would probably be broken Get into pieces. Yellowish. Okay. Right, right. Um, and so, so the ocean um, does a good job at breaking it up, but that also makes the, the problem more difficult because then it's ingestible and more yeah. widespread. And yeah. So Kale, this is a fascinating topic. <laughs> How does an undergraduate student get involved in, you know, a project that you, the UN is interested in, as well as the National Institute of Standards <laughs> and Technology. Um, what, what's your background? I honestly think I just get really lucky. Yeah. And I mean, well, I, I'm from California. I'm from a little surf town in San Diego. Um, and so we're fairly environmentally aware. And I've always been interested um, in kind of living more of a sustainable lifestyle, I guess. And so my interest in plastics, I think, stemmed from that. I was also a, a restaurant or a waitress for eight years in the restaurant industry. So uh, <laughs> pretty, pretty wasteful. Pretty but wasteful but then you came to, to, to UH and discovered your passion for this kind of work? Yeah. Um, so when I came to UH, I actually came here originally to get involved in their bioplastics lab, which was in HNEI. Um, which is the institute? The Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. Natural Energy, OK. Um, things fell through with that though. Uh -huh. So I had to look for other means and I was just talking to everybody that I could, all my professors, all my advisors, I was like, who's doing research in plastics? And no one could give me a direct answer um, except my chemistry advisor, Philip Williams, and then Brian Pope, who is a biogeochemist. And both of them referred me to Jennifer Lynch, uh -huh. who is now my mentor. Right. Um, so both of them emailed her to introduce me and I actually was able to get a little face-to-face -face time with her in Brian Pope's office, and then things just spiraled uh, and, out. And <laughs> obviously, you're getting a degree yeah. at UH. What do you do next? What's your career path? For other people who are interested in this kind of problem, how do you get into it? What kind of jobs are available? Um, you know, so well, if you're coming at it from um, a research aspect, you definitely need to go on and get your PhD, which is what I plan on doing. Um, and that I'll either be in environmental toxicology because I am interested in that side of plastics and there's so much that is unknown in that field regards to plastics and marine debris, or I can also go the materials chemistry route as I've dived pretty heavily in, in polymers. So I have some options. And Jim, what, why should the general public be interested in this kind of topic? You know, what, what, what's the big picture? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's such a, a, a huge issue. And, and like I said at the, at the beginning, we really can't imagine a world without plastic. So it's, it's a little bit unrealistic to think we just remove it all, um, or I should say eliminate the production of it. So yeah. how do we live with this? And um, quite frankly, the, the issues and the questions are so fundamental that we just, um, you know, how much is in the ocean? At this point, we're, we're, we have an educated guess, but it's a guess nonetheless. Uh, how long does it last? What happens to this? I mean, there's a lot of work being done in Europe now that shows it's in a lot of the shellfish there that they're eating. Uh, another big problem is, is with what we call microfibers. So mm -hmm. the clothing that we wear now, if it's made with synthetics, and you wash it, then these fibers that you can't even see with the naked eye go right through the sewage treatment plants, right into the ocean, and the filter feeders like oysters and clams and whatnot mm -hmm. accumulate it. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about it, it's well, of course, is the problem. But if you are a policymaker or 
uh, in the industry, you know, how big a problem is it? I mean, because we have a lot of problems, let's face it. Is this a big one or a small one? Um, and so the, the research is still, it's still out there. And so as a faculty member, where you see Kayla actually getting involved in the toxicology or the, the chemistry of the plastics, is this a, a, a new direction for the research, either of you? Have a comment. And obviously, if you're um, doing a PhD, this is going to be unique to your own studies. Yeah, right? I mean, I think the whole field of marine debris is just kind of new and upcoming. And there's been more work so done, I think, in the physical aspect of plastics in regards to tracking it via ocean currents than there has in the chemistry and toxicology aspect. Um, so I think there's just a lot of work that we can do in that field. And like Jim said, I mean, we're we're not going to be able to not have plastics. We need plastics. Um, you know, I used to work for this other lab that tested for silicate, which is essentially glass. So we couldn't use glassware, and we had to use plastics. But if we can find other means of making plastics more sustainable or environmentally friendly so they can biodegrade back into the environment, or even just making wiser choices as far as manufacturing, consumerism, and disposal, I think will help. And, and so I just happened to pick ah. up my plastic <laughs> yeah. bottle of water, um, which is very useful right now. Yeah. But of course, from your point of view, <laughs> not a good idea, right? I should have no. a reusable water, yeah, water bottle and things like that. So, so very good. So <laughs> a takeaway for our viewers and listeners would be to think ecologically sound mm -hmm. in terms of our uh, consumerism um, just as well. to make more informed choices more informed or just choices. you know be um, be more aware of what you're buying and I know people always think it's hard like oh I have to bring a reusable bag with me to the grocery store oh, I have to carry this water bottle around but I mean it's but with it's like eight billion, <laughs> eight billion people on the planet, then it's really a, a, a growing concern. Yeah. Well, we're getting near the end of the show. So, Kayla and Jim, I want to really thank you for bringing this topic uh, to our viewers' attention. I mean, it's clearly it's important not only to Hawaii but for the survival of the planet as well. You know, our marine ecosystem. Uh, is so fragile. Um, I'm also really pleased to meet you, Kayla, and I wish you every success <laughs> both with your uh, uh, undergraduate career, but also you know, as you go on to your PhD and uh, try and get a, a job in this. Yep. So let me just remind the viewers, you have been watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and our guests today have been Kayla Bruback, who is an undergraduate student in the Global Environmental Studies Program and she's also interning for NIST, and Dr. Jim Patera, who is a specialist at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. So thanks for watching today, and please join us again in the near future for another episode of Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. Goodbye for now. Ha 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 ha!